Hi, I'm John Birmingham. I'm a, a writer and a journalist and uh, once upon a time an historian. Uh, a long time before I wrote books, I used to work in the press uh, and, and specifically in the, the street and the fringe press. So I didn't work for big newspapers or magazines. I, I worked for uh, student newspapers and music magazines. Uh, these were small operations that were, you know, they were, they were fringe. They, they weren't mainstream at all. And I, I used to cover a lot of political demonstrations. And I learned from years of doing that that you couldn't necessarily trust the reports of these demonstrations uh, and sometimes of, you know, riots and so on. You couldn't trust the reports that you would get in the, the mainstream press. And I came to understand that seeking the truth about history was not just a matter of opening up whatever the newspaper from that day or the, the following day said. You, you had to dive dive a little deeper than that. You somehow had to get yourself there into the event, uh, even if it was a hundred years removed from, from where you were. When I was researching Leviathan, which was uh, the, the history of Sydney that I wrote, I was surprised to discover that during the 1930s in Sydney, during a terrible, grim period in uh, our, our national history, which we, we call the Great Depression, when hundreds of thousands of people were out of work, they were thrown out of their homes. People, uh, people used to starve to death in the streets of, of places like Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, during that time, there were thousands, possibly tens of thousands of, of houses, homes and apartments, which were empty because uh, uh, men and women who were out of work simply couldn't afford to pay the rent. A lot of these people, the men in particular, had fought in the First World War. They were the people we now venerate uh, as the Anzacs. And because they'd had that experience of going to war and facing an organised enemy and, and organising themselves to, to, uh, to deal with that enemy, uh, that's what they did on the streets. They, they uh, came together in groups like the International Workers of the World and uh, I think there was one group called the Unemployed Workers Movement or something like that. It was, it was basically just a bunch of guys who'd been mates in the army, who'd fallen on hard times and were, were trying to look after their families. One of the things they did was they took over those houses, they moved back into them, they squatted. That wasn't going to work. Uh, the people who owned those properties didn't want them squatting in there, not paying rent, and so they, they sent in the police force. and. Uh, the police force went in hard, not just with fists and boots and billy clubs, although they used plenty of those, they went in with guns. Uh, and of course the people that they were attacking in those houses were, were ex-soldiers and they had, they'd had guns pointed at them and fired before, so they just, they didn't go to water, they constructed barricades around this place, they ran up barbed wire. It's terrible, violent confrontation, a lot of people, you know, badly, badly hurt out of it. If the only report, the only history, if the only truth of that, uh, that period you knew of was what you read in the paper, what you would read about was a bunch of angry, evil, subversive communists who were trying to ruin everything. Um, luckily, when I was doing my research, just by chance, I came across the paper archives of uh, a lawyer uh, strangely enough, and it was strange in those days, a female lawyer, uh, Christian Jolly Smith, I think her name was, she took witness statements from them. Those witness statements were the only alternative story to what happened in those riots. If I hadn't found those statements, if I hadn't basically, you know, accidentally tripped over them one day in the library in their paper form, the book that I told, the history that I told, would have been a different history, it would have been less accurate. Nowadays, people, they don't write in journals, they don't write letters. Nowadays, they, they make Facebook posts, they tweet, they shoot video on their phone, uh, they you know, do Snapchats and, and Instagrams. All of that stuff, which we don't really think about because it's like the air around us, that's history. That is history in the same way that, uh, you know, Christian Jolly Smith's witness statements were, were history in the, in the same way that the, you know, the, the notebooks of the, the journalists who wrote about those stories, that's all history. And uh, 
that's, that's where the truth lies. And I have seen it firsthand. I, I, I covered a uh, very, very violent confrontation in Melbourne about 10 years ago called the S11 riots. Exactly the same thing as in the 1930s. If you followed the mainstream media's reporting of those riots, all you would see was a bunch of dreadlocked ferals with really unacceptable nose rings trying to rip the system apart. Luckily, those ferals all had phones and uh, they, they made their own reports from within that riot. And what you got was this entirely almost uh, counterfactual history. Like there was history in the pages of the paper and on the, the screens of the, the nightly news. And here was another history told by the people who lived it. That sort of stuff, that's the kind of thing that we will find in digital archives in the future. And that's why it's important to preserve it. I suppose you could ask, why is it important that somebody or some institution like a library preserves this stuff? You know, why would a library want to keep a record of tweets and, and Facebook posts and, and, and blogs, which you know, aren't necessarily written by the most important people in the land. Uh, well, you know, the fact is the history of any land is, is the story of its people. And for the first time in human history, uh, we actually have that story told by the people, you know, not by, you know, the institutions that won. You know, history is written by winners and uh, it's not necessarily the truth things that you see written in textbooks that uh, you, know, you think of as history, that's just, that's just someone's mythology. That's the stories that they like to tell about how things came about. History nowadays is unfolding. It's unfolding in Facebook posts, as I said. You can see it in tweets, uh, see it in blog posts. And you know what those things do seem to be archived. You can get onto uh, Google and you can Google up anything. All of those, uh, all of those posts that I was talking about, the, the protesters in Melbourne at the S11 riots, you could probably find a lot of those within a couple of seconds if you went looking. But only if the service that they posted on was still with us. I used to have a blog on a service called Journal Space. I ran that blog for three years. Uh, it was very popular, lots of people went there. Journal Space collapsed, the blog went away, it's all gone. Can't find it anymore. Facebook. It's an enormous company. It's one of the most important commercial institutions in the world. I think there's like one and a half billion human beings on it every single day. And you know, they, they want to store, and they want to capture and store every piece of data that you put on Facebook because that's their business model. They're selling advertising off it. So why would you need a publicly funded uh, library in a university or just you know a state library, why would you need them going through somewhere like Facebook plucking off posts? Because we don't know that Facebook's going to be with us. You know, some companies last 100 years, not many last much longer than that. Libraries, state libraries, national libraries, they archive memories for thousands of years. Eventually you go somewhere like the British Library and they are looking at the, the memory of that nation going back over millennia. And that is why you need to capture this stuff.